Welcome to Bay Focus. Thank you for joining me today. A very exciting show today. I'm always uh, pleased to be highlighting things that affect our youth and our young adult generation. Some great stories. Some young people are doing amazing things out there uh, to reach people with the gospel. And we have a guest on this show. Boy, you really want to stay tuned. His name is Marcus Clark, and he's going to be on with us in just a few moments, really sharing his testimony, an incredible story of life on the, and, and, and gangs, involved in drugs, a variety of things, and now he's in full-time ministry. Incredible, incredible story. You want to stay tuned for that. But we're going to start today. Brooke Larson, our reporter here, our CTN reporter here for Bay Focus, was out and about here in the Tampa Bay area recently in recent weeks and covering the Redeem the City concert. What an incredible night with music, with a variety of artists, including Israel Houghton and Chris August. Boy, what a great evening she had. She's going to give us a glimpse of that. Let's take a look. Here's Brooke. Music lovers came out recently to the Tampa event, Redeem the City, to worship with a variety of Christian artists. Of those artists being four-time Grammy winner Israel Houghton in Newbreed and Dev Award winner Chris August. Also, Jeremy Vanderloop, We Are Messengers, and Courtney Ballestero. Redeem the City was located at Iglesia de Dios Pentecostal and hosted by Victory Tabernacle. We are a church that really wants to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. We believe in the power of the blood of Jesus to redeem the city. We believe in taking territory for the kingdom's sake. And so we wanted to have a concert with Israel and, and really glorify the Lord and, and give people an opportunity to come in contact with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I made it a point to sit down with Israel Houghton to talk about his latest album, Covered, Alive in Asia. So your new album just came out. How do you feel? I feel great. I mean, it literally came out today. I just today. Um, and there's been a lot, you know, it's, we've been working on this project in some form for about a year. And so about this time last year, we went into rehearsals and, you know, we've been writing for it. And then uh, in September, we went into very intensive rehearsals. And then in October, we went to six different countries in Asia and uh, recorded this record and found ourselves in front of a lot of people in all these different countries. We had a blast. and. And then the post work of putting it all together, uh, a lot of that was uh, heavy because of um, we did a whole documentary, a whole concert film documentary of our journey and, and uh, also just the fact that New Breed's been together for 15 years. And so today it's, it's, it's a great day to kind of deliver that baby and, and get it out there for everybody to hear. So why Asia? I think why Asia for us was we wanted to show the rest of the world how strong the church in Asia is and how um, global this good news message reaches. And um, you got people there who just love God and are passionate about worship and passionate about the presence of God. So we, you know, I think anytime you're thinking about doing a live record, you want to go somewhere where there's going to be great energy captured, where there's going to be um, a reception. You don't want you don't want to have to work super hard to like hope that people like the stuff. So you want to go somewhere where you've got a developed um, trust with them over the years, and uh, and and that's what we did. Do you ever get into the habit of I've got this? That kind of I got this mentality when you step up on the stage, and um, have you ever had to fight against that? Oh sure. I mean I think I think you know you you look at your early development as. Okay, God, I need you. I'm dependent on you. I, it's going to be horrible if you're not here. <laughs> and then you get the hang of that. Right. And and a lot of times, what what you do as a musician, as an artist, and even as a as a as a minister, is you can take things into well, this is second nature for me. And when I start, when things start getting too easy and 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 too second nature, that's when I always sort of regroup and go, okay, I want to be challenged again because I want, to, I want to be the good kind of nervous again. Like, God, I really, really am depending on you. And so anytime it starts becoming too easy and I have to fight that within myself, I always find myself open to a new challenge. And not just skill-wise, but like, God, I want to unlearn some of the stuff I've unlearned so I can learn more from you. I also sat down with Chris August as he shared with us the story behind his most recent album, 
The Maker. Your latest album, The Maker, tell us a little bit, little bit about the history of that. Yeah, it was fun. Like, we tracked it all live in the studio, and a lot of it is uh, kind of life events I was going through. Um, I had a brain injury about yeah. a little over three years ago, and so a lot of the, a handful of songs are kind of in response to that and the Lord healing me uh, in a very difficult time. And tell us and, about that healing. Yeah, so basically I was, I had a brain bleed, brain swelling, and so for about four months I was on pain, like some strong pain medication. Like, I'm talking that's uh, the good stuff. You know what I'm saying? And I, I'm a, I sell it on my merch table. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, but no, that's horrible. But I was, I, my body became addicted to it. I mean, four months of taking that stuff, you, I mean, there's a reason why people get addicted to it. You know, it makes you feel awesome. And so it's like, I'm sitting here, what do I do? You know, I mean, I, every time I don't take it, I'm sick. Like I start getting sick and it, I mean, it was horrible. And, and so I was in a real difficult time. And so I just had to really lean on the Lord and just wean myself off of that. And finally I get off of the pain medication, and two months later get diagnosed with depression. It's like, my goodness, I can't catch a break. I'm now taking more pills, different ones now. So now I'm on this pill, and there's with depression medicine, a lot of side effects, more pills. And so about three months into me taking those pills, I was on tour, tour with a band, Big Daddy Weave, awesome guys, and I'm seeing the Lord just working every night doing these miracles. I mean, I'm watching people getting healed. I'm talking like I wasn't raised in church. I haven't seen a lot of stuff. I'm watching in front of my face. And I'm like, this is awesome. One night on the bus, Mike Weaver, the lead singer, Big Daddy Weave, I was like, he knew what I was going through. I was like, wait a second. We're praying for all these people every night. Like, I want it. Like, what about me? Like, I have a hard time right now. Asked the Lord to heal me that night. Immediately started pursuing after him, reading his word for literally hours every day, learning Hebrew, everything I could. Anything that was not of him, that was any sort of distraction, I let it go. Even stuff that was like, that's not necessarily wrong or anything, I just... I said, not right now. I got a, it's a critical time in my life. And, you know, I asked him to heal me and I pursued after him and I haven't taken one pill since that moment, since I asked him to heal me. He healed me totally. And so it's, a lot of these songs are, you know, I have a song on there called He's Still Here that's just a reminder that says his miracles weren't just for 2,000 years ago when he was walking and physically here, you know. It's like, you know, we, we think now, well, I wish I could just touch the cloth, you know, I could be healed. You know, that's the, that's the point of the cross and the resurrection is that we can. He's still here. And so for me, that's kind of the whole theme of the whole album. And and there's, of course, a handful of love songs. I always throw a handful of love songs on my records because I grew up listening to Stevie Wonder and R&B okay. music, so I can't. Right, right. It's just in me. I can't help it. And and so I, and it's funny with this one. I've had them on every one of my records, but for some reason on this record, people have been like, oh, Chris got engaged. She's getting married or something. And I'm like, I'm like, no, I'm just still writing those love songs because I just have them in my head, you know. It was another successful event here in Tampa, Florida. It was such a joy to sit down with some of the artists and just talk music. You know, so many of the artists brought such different, unique styles and just really rocked the house tonight. Reporting for Bay Focus, I'm Brooke Larson. Thank you, Brooke. What a great story to, to share and what great music, a night of music and opportunity for ministry. have to say I absolutely love all the artists featured there and I particularly many, many years now enjoyed the music of Israel Houghton. Tremendous, tremendous ministry. Uh, we're going to, to change direction but a little bit here, but again, some things that are appealing to, to youth. We have an incredible story to share here with you. Marcus Clark is with us and, and he is the founder of Sweat for Life Ministries and what that means is speak words of encouragement today and, and he has learned to do this through his own story. Marcus, thank you so much for yeah. coming on the thank program you. today. Thank um, you. Just tremendous how we even connected and how I heard about you and um, the lives you've already touched. But before we talk about your ministry, before we get into that, um, you have a personal story um, that is, is so compelling and how you even came to the Lord, how God got a hold of your life. But tell us a little bit about your story. You, you weren't always serving the Lord. No, I was not, as, not at all. You know, I was one of the uh, troubled youth out there in the streets, running, doing life the way I thought it should have been done, not according to God's ways and God's plans and how um, he was. I, I knew that as a youngster, because I was 11 years old when I heard about God, but not as the way I've heard how I was supposed to live. I wasn't living that way at all. Yeah. So I just took it into my own hands and I ran amok with it, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, and what, what did that mean? So how did you, you, you literally, when I looked at your story, um, you literally were involved in, in um, 
crime. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. what 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 kind of life were you leading? Well, growing up as a youth on the streets uh, of the south side of St. Petersburg, you know there was a lot of violence going on around the time I was you know, 17, 16, 17, 18 years old, coming up in that system. And you know I'm a family. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a second oldest of eight children. You know six sisters and one brother, and being that my mom was on welfare, my dad was the only, my stepfather was the only worker in the house. I just, I became, you know, the black sheep of the family and I took to the streets because it was six girls in the house, first of all, you know, and that could, that could kind of drive a young man insane, you know. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when your dad tells you, how you really feel, Mark. <laughs> yeah, when, when, when your dad tells you, don't don't hit your sisters. I say, can I at least choke them? <laughs> yeah. You know, he said you can't do that either. So no. I tried. I had to get out another way. My yeah. my anger and frustrations. I had to find another way to channel it, and I took to the streets, and that's where I found a lot of my mentors, guys who were dropouts, guys who I saw were. Um, on drugs, selling drugs, and that's why I, those guys who I called mentors, they, were, mm -hmm. they weren't mentors, but that's what I was looking up to, older guys on the street corners, and I saw all the flashy things about that lifestyle, the cars, the women, the clothes, the jewelry, and I wanted a piece of it. And so about 16 years old, I left home and I got, got out in the streets, you know, I just, I, I left home never to return. I, when it took to the streets and I, I got involved with drugs, I got involved with selling drugs because again, like I said, some of the guys who I was looking up to were basically showing me how to do it. And that's that's what I took to. So learning those ways of the streets, you get sucked into it kind of rather quick. Yeah, okay, now there was a pivotal thing that happened that mm -hmm. suddenly started to alter your course. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. You were. You were held up at gunpoint oh, yeah. by a, a friend mm -hmm. in a car. You were actually about to become a father. Yes, uh, that incident where it was a time where I took this one guy in. He was my friend, so to say. He was a, he was a friend of mine, very good friend of mine, because I took him in, and he ended up getting hooked on drugs, my friend. But the thing was, all of my other friends that didn't really take to him quite easy, were the ones who were saying, you know, get rid of this guy because anytime something would come up missing, they would blame him. But I knew in my heart it wasn't him. But the majority was against the minority, and I voted with the majority. And this was my personal friend I was voting against. And he kind of took harsh to that. It t he took that to heart and rather took it kind of hard. And sitting at a stop sign one day in my, in my car, he jumped inside my car, not knowing you know, he was gonna do anything like he did because he was my friend. But what he did next, I didn't expect, and he put a gun to my head. And he went to rob me, he got everything off of me, and he told me why he was robbing me, simply because of the fact that he felt like, because he, he was a crackhead, he wasn't the things we were calling him. He wasn't a thief or a liar. We were making him be those things, and I knew he wasn't a thief or a liar, but he felt I could have stopped him. Hence the words, speak words of encouragement. Mm -hmm. He felt like I could have stopped that and I didn't. And so he put a gun in my head to rob me. At the point as he was robbing me, 15 minutes prior to that, I got a phone call from my then girlfriend's mother who was calling me to say, Marcus, you need to get down to the hospital. And I said, well, why? I already knew why, but she's reminded me. Because my girl at the time, she she's went into labor. And I thought, no, oh, okay, I'll get there when I want to. You know, I get there, you know. My lifestyle wasn't, yeah. you know, was, I was more to into myself than I was worried about getting to the hospital. Okay, I'm gonna fast forward here. You 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 ended up you had the baby came. You were able to yes. get there to I able to get to the hospital. Finally yes. get there. Yep. Um, and then something else traumatic happened some yes. months later. At this point, this point if I and you tell me because I, I know we have limited time, so I'm right. trying to get it. But you began to recognize that you needed God in your life, but you weren't quite ready yet to right. commit to him, but something else happened right. with your child that really changed things. Yeah, when, when, when my friend pulled the trigger on me and the gun didn't go off, I, I, and, I, and I got to the hospital, I made promises to God that I wouldn't return to that lifestyle. And I, I lied to God because I did return to that lifestyle. Four months later, God was calling me another way because he felt I didn't hear him in the, in the car with my friend. He said, now I'm gonna have to call you another way which was uh, December 25th, Christmas Day, 2006. 
I was over there, it was Christmas Day, I was hanging with my uh, girl, my daughter at the time, she was four years old, and my son was four months old. Well, um, after I leave from my girlfriend's house to go back home about nine o'clock that night, uh, um, I get a phone call, and I see it's my girlfriend on the um, line, and she's screaming through the phone, you know, these blood-curling screams, Marcus, you need to hurry up and get back over here. And I'm like, well, why? She says, because the house is on fire. And I had to just pause for a minute, like, wait a minute, what? She said, the house is on fire. So I get in my car, rush back over there. Here I am, this house I just left 15 minutes ago. I'm watching, blazing in this big ball of fire. And I was in shock. She grabs, she grabs me and she tells me, I'm asking, where's everybody? You know, her mother made it out, she, my daughter made it out, but my four month old son didn't make it out. And you know, the firefighters would not let you go in. Firefighters they would not let they stopped me. You. Yeah. They would it's not let me. Heartbreaking. Go in. Yeah, they heartbreaking. Just, yeah. But it was at that point, and and then I want it. I want to take this to where God has you today. But that was at that point that God spoke you mm -hmm. to you something really significant. Right. The, the the question was when I fell to my knees. You know, naturally you want to faint, but I fell to my knees, and I cried out. I asked God three questions. I remember in the Bible. I don't remember the scripture. But it says that he hears the voices of our cries all the way up into his temple, even into his ears. That means in a desperate moment, he's going to answer you. And in a desperate moment, I cried out to God. And I asked God three questions. I said, well, God, why couldn't I save my son's life? And he said, because it wasn't your mission to save your son's life. Then I said, well, God, why couldn't these firemen who are trained run into this burning house and save my son's life? He said, because it wasn't their mission to save your son's life. And I said, well, God, why couldn't my son's life be saved? And he said, because it was your son's mission to save your life. Hmm. Wow. And in that moment. That's, that's, you know, that's hard to take but at, at that point, but it was God's way of saying, I have a plan. He said he'll trade us beauty for ashes. Yeah. He took my, he took my pain and gave me joy. Yeah. And, and, and he put a, right then and there, it was like flipping on a switch, did my life change. I never looked back. Ten, it'll be 10 years, 2016. I never looked back to that lifestyle ever again. Never went back. It was like flipping on a light switch. And I even got up in that moment and had a smile on my face. My girl was looking at me crazy, like, what is wrong with you? I was like, I just heard from God. I, I was okay at the moment. I knew everything was going to be okay. Even at the funeral, I was comforted knowing that I was okay. God was taking care of me. Okay. And, and that's, just, that's just one of the more compelling testimonies I've heard on, on how... Um you have totally transitioned into a, a walk with the Lord and a tough, tough way to go. But um, God has totally, radically changed your life. And you have this ministry now. Mm -hmm. um, and we were talking before we did this show on um, some of the things you're doing with young people. Mm -hmm. First of all, tell our viewers, what is Sweat for Life? speaking words of encouragement today. That involves a lot of things, because you go out and speak and you do different yes. things. There's a lot that falls under that. So right. tell us what that is. Well, I do, um, it's a speaking ministry. It's a speaking and mentoring ministry. I'm a, um, I'm a school, Hillsborough County, Pinellas County youth speaker. I go into those public schools and I speak inspiration, motivation, encouragement. And I also mentor in Pinellas County schools, where I take, I get, I keep, I get two mentors a year and I mentor those, you know, those children. And the word speak, S-W-E-T, was the scripture, the day in the grass I had to watch the house burn, was the scripture God gave me, which was Ephesians 4.29. It says, speak words of edification. So I took speak words of encouragement. And he says, speak words of edification so that it lifts your brothers and sisters up and imparts grace to those who hear. Those were the words I was hearing God say to me. He was saying, if you only spoke love to your friend, the crackhead, he would have had a different heart. But because I was speaking down about him and his lifestyle, that happened, and it transpired a whole change of events. And, and, and I took those words, speak words of encouragement today, um, and made it my ministry. Yeah. And now I go out and I speak inspiration and encouragement to a lot of young men and women. But I also am using it to develop a program, a mentoring boys and girls program, where I have young boys. Actually, I'm in working with St. Petersburg College right now, um, the director over there, who's going to allow me to use a facility in, the, in, in, their, um, in their location there. And I'm going to take a room and I'm going to develop my mentoring program in that college where a lot of these kids were, you know, we have a bullying epidemic in our yeah, schools. Yeah, yeah. 
So what I'm doing is trying to change the mind of our young kids because anything that trends will transcend <laughs> with these young kids. So I'm trying to use good words of encouragement by taking a bunch of a group of young kids, developing their communication skills through other ways and not just talking verbally, but through arts. I'm a poet mm -hmm. and I love arts. I love music. I love anything about the arts. So every, I believe everybody has a, what I call an MBA talent, natural born ability. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. I believe everybody has a natural born ability, a gift God has given them. So I want to develop, I want to, I want to get these kids and ex expose that and show them, hey, you can use this gift to communicate to your peers among schools and then they go into schools and they talk to their friends and they're wearing these wristbands, sweat for life wristbands and they're, everybody's talking about sweat for life, what is it? The other kids wanna know and then they wanna come. And, that, and now we have a different change in culture and mindset in the schools, especially with the schools I'm involved with because I, I, because I can only do so much with what I'm involved in. So I'm trying to do it even in, more so in the schools that I'm in. So what you're saying then too with the um the bullying in particular mm -hmm. and changing how they talk mm -hmm. is you're you're really trying to get um, young people mm -hmm. to just talk to each other differently yes. so, that, so that in itself mm -hmm. would would cut cut back and stop yes. the the intimidation yes. at schools the bullying that what is said on Facebook what is sent on all these things that they will just are, are you getting are they receptive to oh, I get um every day on Facebook for since October I've posted I post a daily inspirational message on Facebook every day, every morning about nine o'clock. And I tell those kids, hey, if you need some inspiration, if you need someone to go to to find positive messages, you can always do um, inspirational art with pictures that I do and have a message or a scripture with it. So I always say, if you're looking for anything inspirational, you, a lot of these kids turn to MTV and VH1. I say, hey, go to my Facebook channel and you'll find the inspiration that you need. But I also tell them when I'm speaking to these kids, I say, speaking words of encouragement is what I call the power of confirmation, affirmation. What I say to these kids, I say, hey, listen, when Johnny over there is telling you that he wants to be an engineer, you want to absolutely boost Johnny's, um, you know, his, that boost that up in Johnny and telling Johnny, hey, I believe you can absolutely do that. I believe that that is for you. I've seen how smart you are because when you're confirming that dream to him, what are you doing is you're affirming those same words back to yourself mm -hmm. because you're not going to say something to someone and believe it's possible for them if you're over here with dreams of your own not believing that you can do anything with your own dreams. You're not gonna believe that anything's possible for him if it's not possible for you. So when you're confirming someone else's dreams, you affirm those words to yourself saying, if he can do it, I can do it, yeah. you know? And that's what my message is, is, is me saying to the kids, if I can do it, coming from where I come from, yeah. you can do it, it's, it's open for you. Yeah, oh, that's just, well, and that would be a powerful um, way to do it. I mean, you, you totally, come from from a different different world and how God's totally altered you and and but I, I love your your positive energy I love the excitement and and uh, that you've excitement for things of God that you excitement that people can change their lives that they can they can make a difference you also connect with some of these young people personally you you have a big social media presence oh yes Andrew. and you're, you're like one-on-one -on -one with yes. some of these oh kids, yes right? oh I definitely um I definitely go back to my neighborhood and I tell these kids, because see, what happened with me was when I was in the neighborhood and I saw the wrong mentors, quote unquote, I go back and I say, you know what, hey, um, what I was looking for was mentors to come in and say, Marcus, you know what, there's a rec league down the center that's starting a basketball league. I think you can, you, I've seen you play basketball. Why don't you join the basketball league? I see a lot of these kids on the basketball court, on the football field, on the baseball field with tremendous talent and they go right back to their neighborhoods with the mindset of there's no way out for them. Yeah. So what I do is I come back to the neighborhoods where I'm coming from, all neighborhoods though, to all walks of life, and I say to these kids, I say, hey, I know a rec center, I know the coach down there. If you go down there and just play ball or pick up game, the coach down there will catch you playing. And he, he would want to ask you to join his team. You don't know, but I, I take a lot of these kids personally, one-on-one, -on -one, I take them down to the rec center and I play basketball with them. I play football with them. And I try to share with these kids, hey, there is positivity out here. There is somebody that care for you. There is somebody that love you because I didn't feel that. 
So I want these kids to feel that somebody cares, somebody loves them, somebody's coming back for them, nobody's forgotten about you. And I take them down to the rec center. And I try to sign them up for whatever is, whatever they're interested in. If it's basketball, let me, let's sign you up for the basketball team. If it's football, let's hang up for the flag football team. Whatever it is, so I get personal with these kids. And I always tell them, hey, find me on Facebook, find me on, on Twitter, yeah. find me on YouTube. I yeah. got YouTube videos that post all inspirational videos they can find. Yeah, okay, all right, Marcus. And, and so um, you would be available, and we're down to just, just a, a minute left here, mm -hmm. but you're available to do what? If, if somebody's listening to you, you go out, where do you go speak? Where can people kind of? Um, I go anywhere. You go to churches, I go to schools. churches, schools community organizations, yeah. businesses also. I've spoken yeah. in many businesses. I, I speak in um, any type of form or setting that you're looking to bring in somebody to um, upbeat, you know, the, the status quo of the energy level inside yeah. the yeah. building. Okay, that sounds great. Marcus, thank you so much for sharing your testimony with us. And on screen, you're going to see one more time ways that you can contact Marcus Clark. He's not hard to find, I'm telling you that. He's out there, he's got his message out, and wow, what a great opportunity it would be to have him come and speak at your group and, and be a part of, of anything, a youth outreach that you're doing, uh, or schools. Boy, I hope you contact with Marcus. Stay tuned on the screen. Here's how you can reach Marcus Clark, and we'll be right back with more of Bay Focus. To contact Marcus Clark and Sweat for Life Ministries, please call 727-455-8348. That number again, 727-455-8348. Or send an email to marcusinspires at gmail.com. You can also connect with Marcus Clark on Facebook and Marcus Inspires on YouTube and Instagram. Bay Focus puts the spotlight on Tampa Bay. Join host Darlene Greenlee as she takes a look at the people and events reaching our Central Florida communities with the gospel. Plan to watch Bay Focus Wednesday mornings at 11.30 and Thursday nights at 7 right here on your CTN station. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's program. Wow, I so enjoyed talking with Marcus Clark here. Incredible testimony, incredible ministry he's doing with young people. And then also uh, recovering the Redeem the City concert that happened here. Uh, thanks to Brooke Larson for doing that and the team here she took from CTN to go do that. I'm always appreciative of people and concert artists and speakers that make time for us to come and talk with them as well, too. Thank you for tuning in this week. I hope you'll tune in next week. We'll see you then. May God richly, richly bless you.